Hello and welcome to Elector Engineering Insights, the show that puts your engineering challenges to the industry's experts. I'm your host, Stuart Cording, the electronics reporter. Now, your workbench, like mine, is probably well stocked with test equipment, but one day a new measurement task appears. Some days you can make do with the equipment you have, but on others it becomes clear that a tool dedicated to the measurement task would make more sense. Battery-powered sensors for IoT are one example where the current flowing can drop into the nanoamp range but then jump to milliamps when data is being exchanged. And differential signals are another example. Yes, you can use two oscilloscope probes, but would a differential probe deliver better results? To find out more, my experts for this episode are Werner Johansson from Koitech and CS Wong from Roden Schwartz. So welcome Werner, it's great to see you, how are you? I'm very well, thanks for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what your role is at Koitech? Oh yeah, uh, I do some hardware, I do some uh, FPGA gateware, I do some firmware and some driver work on the PC side. So a little bit of everything, low level. Um, I've been doing quite a lot of the low power um, hardware designs in the past. Super. That's the short version. Excellent. So we look forward to finding out a little bit more about that low power um, experience that you have and uh, how Coitex tools help in debugging those challenges. So hang on in there and we'll be back to you shortly. Yeah. And we also have CS from Roden Schwartz. Hi CS, how are you doing? Hello, happy to be here. I'm good. S super. So um, mm -hmm. just give us a brief introduction on how you help customers at Roden Schwartz with their um, oscilloscope and measurement challenges. Okay. So I'm CS Wong. I'm a product manager for the oscilloscope in Roden Schwartz. Um, I've taken up this uh, PM role relatively new. Previously, I was a scope BD and also a AE in Roden Schwartz in Singapore, but I joined the bigger team here. So basically, I got what I learned from my customers and then try to put that into our product. Hopefully we can build better uh, product to be able to help our customers out there. Super. Great. Mm -hmm. Thanks ever so much. Well, we'll be back with you shortly and uh, we'll be discussing a little bit more about those um, uh, probes for oscilloscopes. So All right. see you shortly. Now, this episode is sponsored by Elector. If you like electronics, you'll love the articles, projects, and insights you can access as an Elector member. Our global design community has hundreds of thousands of active members and more than a thousand contributing experts. You can go traditional and get our magazine delivered to your door or go digital only and read online. Either way, you get access to years of information and projects as well as our active community. Follow the link, uh, which is in the description of the video, and sign up today. So over the years, uh, over my years in industry, I've dealt with many challenging measurement problems from analyzing low power DSP applications to accurate measurement of high precision oscillators. That's why I'm so excited to learn more about the tools our guests have to share with us. However, this show is for you engineers out there struggling with your designs. So regardless of where you're watching, post your questions and comments during the show using the chat function on YouTube and LinkedIn. Or if you're on Twitter, use the hashtag electrolei and we'll do our best to get answers or guide you to resources that might help. So let's bring back Werner. Hi there again, good to uh, have you here on the show. So where I wanted to start was um, with uh, the Internet of Things. I think with the growth of the Internet of Things, um, we've seen that we need sensors that can operate for as long as possible, either from a battery or from some other energy harvesting source. Um, why is something like a multimeter or some other sort of tool uh, not suited uh, an ideal for this type of measurement? What sort of current power or power levels are engineers trying to measure in these applications? Yeah, so basically uh, where the multimeter will fail you is due to the dynamic range. Uh, because if you're trying to measure the sleep current in the nanoamps, or more realistically, hundreds of nanoamps in a typical uh, environment, all of a sudden when you wake up and you start a sensor, uh, you might consume... 20 milliamps, 30 milliamps. Uh, then you start a radio and you might consume several hundred milliamps, especially for cellular. And 
during that transition, you will uh, have a really hard time measuring this with a regular multimeter because the drop will simply be too high before the multimeter has time to switch range into a more suitable milliamp, hundreds of milliamp range. Um, that's that's basically um, the, the main challenge, uh, dynamic range um, and loss over the shunt resistor that you need to measure the current over. And uh, so measurement tools as well, can they have an, imp an impact on the, the energy source, like uh, an energy harvesting device that reduces the amount of energy uh, that can be delivered? Sometimes, uh, I mean, multimeters today, they tend to have a fairly reasonable input impedance. Uh, 10 mega ohms is fairly typical for, for a multimeter, which might sound a lot, but when you start doing the math, that's, uh, that's 300 nanoamps at three volts. Yeah. Which means that if you try to measure the voltage across a harvesting device, you might actually completely ruin it because it might actually be all you get, the 300 nanoamps. Yeah. So it might very well have a big impact. And again, going back to the shunt measurement in your ammeter, you will have a loss. And it's typically uh, several ohms uh, to several kilo ohms of shunt resistors if you're going to measure low currents. And uh, that will also have an impact. So you want to minimize that as much as possible. Now, Coitex, well known for the OT Arc Pro, that's a, a hardware tool coupled with some uh, software, and um, that's it's been on the market for quite for quite a while now. Um, and if you look at the description of that tool, it's called a source measurement unit or an SMU. Why are these types of tools so well suited to power measurements, especially in your case, low power measurements in battery powered applications? Dynamic range being primary again, and the fact that uh, a source measurement unit is typically used to both source and sink current. And that uh, is two completely different things when you're trying to optimize your Internet of Things device. Uh, but in one, uh, one use case, you need to source current into your device. Basically, you replace the battery with the SMU. The other part is that you want to test a charger or you want to test the battery itself, and then you can discharge the battery uh, or emulate the battery with it. So that's the, the two, uh, two main parts. We're not, we're not a full, uh, full out SMU uh, where you talk about a four quadrant SMU. Uh, that difference would be that we don't support the negative voltages. Right. Uh, so we can't source and sync negative voltage. But we are the two positive parts that we can source and sync positive voltage. So that's, yeah. that's what sort of makes it different then from a, a classic SMU that um, the other test equipment manufacturers offer. The, the, the other main thing is size and the lack of fans. Typically, you have fairly loud fans in yeah. uh, the SMU. So I have one right next to me here and it's crazy loud when it's turned on. Um, so uh, that's that's the part that we wanted to make something that you can actually just put in your laptop bag and carry with you at all times. Um, most of the time also just being USB power. You don't even need, I mean, if you're doing some low power stuff, you don't even need an external power support. No, exactly, yeah. That's, the USB is more than enough for that, isn't it? So. Um... If you've, you've obviously supported lots of customers through the process of, of, um, of analyzing the power for their low power and battery powered applications, what's the sort of process that uh, developers have to go through for power profiling an application? Add lots of uh, CRO resistors so you can uh, pull them out and isolate the subsystems. Uh, with, the, uh, with the OT solution, we, we have the ability that you can actually not only measure power with the uh, the main terminals, we have the ability to measure subsystems as well. So you can directly measure across a shunt if you just replace your zero ohm resistor with a suitable low ohm uh, resistor, and then we can measure across that to identify which part of the system uh, actually uh, consumes uh, current or too much current. Um, that's that's one of the the parts that. Um, 
always design your hardware with lots of test points and uh, lots of zero ohm resistors. That's the uh, the key. And uh, in in to, that's the sort of the hardware side of, of the application. Is is there are there any sort of tips that you have for for the software side of the application in order that um, you know that the power profiling can be uh, profiled at all? Uh, yeah, the main thing is if you're going to do low power, you can't instrument it when your debugger is present. It simply won't work because the the debugging requires several debug subsystems inside the MCU to be active and those clocks can't be turned off, which makes it really difficult to, to determine what's actually happening there. Uh, so instead you need to instrument in some other way where you can listen only. Uh, uh, one of those uh, would be the, uh, the UART interface, which we've seen is the, the lowest power uh, in terms of how much power is actually being used in order to be able to output data. We, uh, one of the first features that we added uh, years ago was the fact that we can capture UART data together with the power consumption um, of the device. And then you can just select UART messages and you will immediately see uh, which part of the, uh, the graph is being um, uh, causing that. Um, so UART is one of those that it's great. You just need to remember to turn it off when you're done, when you enter yeah. real deep sleep. Otherwise, the clocks won't turn off. So basically, clocking is the, the main thing. Most MCUs these days, they're pretty good at if you don't have a clock, it will power the, uh, the subsystem down. Mm -hmm. But if you force those clocks to be on, it will continue to consume current. I think it's also very tempting when you're developing an application, you get very fo much focused on trying to make the application work and, and um, focus on, on the features of the application. Um, I guess it probably also makes sense to have a sort of second version of software where you can really um, activate the individual elements of the system and, and turn on and turn off the radio transceiver, for example, to, to really be able to focus on the power consumption of each element of the circuit. Yeah, like a specific test program. Most of the time, you, you really want to avoid having a specific test program. You want that to be embedded in the actual um, uh, firmware itself, if it at all possible. Uh, but the thing is that the, the main uh, driver here is that you really want low power or power management to be part of very early firmware. There are two things that tend to have to wait until... Um, end of development, and that's um, low power, and it's firmware upgrade. Uh, those two should basically be the first you implement and not the last. Um, and I've seen it over and over again that you, you tend to push those later on because, of course, you can just flash a new firmware with the uh, debugger, but not everybody can. No. Exactly, it's, it's not, not not a caper. Not everybody's got a, a debugger available nope. in the field to do. Uh, it, it's happening over and over because that's how you start, and that's the, your early bring up, and then it just well, it works, and then you continue doing that. But the yeah. firmware upgrade and low power, even though it's not the lowest power, you want to very early on get a feel for the actual power consumption of the device. And if you yeah. continuously see that on your screen, if you're using things like an, the, uh, the OTI um, uh, ARC or ACE, um, you will see when all of a sudden your idle power consumption goes either up or down uh, by a lot, uh, especially when you're trying to release new software. And um, it might lead to two things. Either you forgot to enable something and the power consumption dropped, and that's a problem or you actually fixed some leakage current somewhere. Yeah. So it's a... Uh... Yeah, it's always a, a debugging challenge, isn't it? To keep looking around and trying to find out, uh, yeah, what, what's changed? What have, I, what have I enabled or engaged or turned off, uh, which yeah. has uh, resulted in the change? So um, we've got a picture on the screen at the minute of uh, the OT hardware. We've got the OT Arc uh, and the OT Ace Pro are the, the two hardware tools you have. But obviously, um, seeing it's a, it's a two-quadrant SMU, 
but uh, another big important part of a, of a tool like this, maybe more so than a normal SMU, is the, the software environment to, to make those measurements and yep. uh, to capture all the, the data so as you can do that po power profiling. So can you take us a little bit through the software environment uh, for, for the tools? Yeah, basically, um, let's, uh, let's bring the, uh, the software up and uh, I'll... Uh... I'll show it um, there. Basically, um, when you perform a recording, uh, you will get the current and the voltage and uh, power uh, showing up as um, regular um, scope recordings. Here's the, um, the UART as well. So if you select the, the UART, it will automatically select whichever part of the, uh, this analog graphs as well. So this will just show you real time when you're recording, and then you can just zoom and you can you can do all of that in the um, uh, in the uh, the window. And uh, this is very difficult to do on a regular SMU with a very small screen. So you you want something with a uh, a better screen like your laptop. Um, then you can do all this. We have no controls whatsoever on the actual uh, on the actual box. You need to attach it to a computer. And because we were talking about um, the uh, profiling, we have this uh, ability to to discharge batteries from within the software. Then you just disconnect your device and you connect your battery instead. We can discharge a battery, create a profile that we can then emulate uh, in the actual uh, software. This will show you the open circuit voltage of the battery, and this is the internal resistance of the battery from full all the way to empty to the right. Then you just choose how many you want in parallel and series, and off you go. And then you can basically just move this where you want to simulate or emulate the battery from. So you want to emulate an almost empty battery. Uh, you just start there and off you go. So that's an interesting point because um, as the battery discharges, uh, there's often a situation where um, yeah, maybe the electronics isn't quite capable of, of passing the, or yeah, managing the, the, the power through, through the system. Maybe there's an LDO or a DC-DC converter that's uh, maybe not optimized as that, sort of, as that power, as the voltage level drops, you can, you can have problems further down uh, in then, in then uh, feeding, feeding power to the microcontroller. Yeah, especially when you're waking up from sleep, because all of a sudden you consume a lot of current or more yeah. current than in sleep. And with increasing internal resistance of that battery, the more that voltage on the actual terminals will drop when you wake up. And eventually you either lock up or you have a brownout uh, watchdog capturing it and resetting, and then it will just boot loop all over until you replace the battery. Yeah. Um, which is also why we have this way of saying fixed. We want to simulate one exact part of the battery, and it's not going to move from there, uh, which means you can test this all over and over, even from scripting. If you're actually scripting this in an automated test, you can say, I always want to start at 80% depleted battery, run this test until it actually uh, turns off. That's also possible to, uh, to do, which is yeah. very difficult to do with a real battery. Do, do the same challenges apply also to um, uh, energy harvesting um, energy sources as well? Even more so, really, because typically energy harvesting sources like solar cells, uh, they have a very high apparent internal resistance. I mean, it, as soon as you start loading it, the voltage will drop. So you need these... Um, these energy harvesting controllers um, uh, that actually deals with maximum power point tracking to extract as much power as you can possibly get and then charge a storage device like a supercap or one of the small batteries that you find inside um, all kinds of headsets and uh, these days the sub milliamp hour batteries that yeah. can can run the, the device for a small amount of time until you get more light. But yeah, it's uh, the higher 
the internal resistance, the more difficult this gets. And coin cells such as this CR2450 that, uh, that we're, we're looking at here, it's actually 19.1 uh, ohms is the, uh, the maximum here. And right. the energy harvesting ones are even worse. Okay. We, we profiled a grapefruit battery that had uh, over a thousand ohms of internal resistance, basically two metal plates in a grapefruit, which yeah. is also a similar kind of energy harvesting. Yeah, but not quite as popular. <laughs> uh, no. Or potatoes. <laughs> so yeah, no, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's difficult when, uh, when the currents are so small and you don't want to interfere and you don't want to have the measurements mess it up. Yeah. So uh, we, we are working on, on all three sides of this energy harvesting controllers. So we can, we can emulate the battery. We can emulate the energy harvesting device and we can emulate the device you're actually trying to power off of it. Now, the the um, the other point when I was looking um, over the, the tools is that the the OTARC Pro is is limited to five, a five volt supply. But yes. uh, nowadays, we're also seeing lots of other sort of what we would call IoT applications that use um, much higher voltages, uh, like e-scooters, for example, they 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 need to be um, in a low power mode as well when they're not being used, but still remain connected to back end services to track them. Um, can you support uh, application, or how how do you sort of support applications that are using a higher voltage than five volts? So with the the new product, the Oti Ace Pro, uh, we can do uh, that. Is uh, the Oti Ace Pro? It's now we can go all the way down to zero volts. And we can go to 25 volts. Right. Um, there is always a challenge uh, doing uh, these things when you're when you're above what the uh, op amp manufacturers um, is uh, is having available in terms of no drift, very low noise op amps. So um, we can get up to 25 volts um, for traction, as in e-scooters, e scooters and uh, EVs, uh, cars. Uh, we can't quite fully go all the way up to um, to traction, but most of the time we can definitely deal with the control, the ECUs. Um, so the telematics, for instance, in an e-scooter, we can definitely support that. Uh, if the pack, a pack voltage is lower than 25 volts, we can, uh, we can definitely power um, that whole thing except for the motor because we're limited by... Uh, available power basically in this uh, setup um, a maximum of uh, 50 watts uh, for for a short amount of time is what we can deliver but that requires again an external power supply on the on the back but um, yeah it's still not enough to run a motor uh, yeah that's uh, but the the telematics that's the part where you really need to optimize the uh, the sleep uh, current. I mean, mm -hmm. it obviously has to be awake at some point to to ping back, but uh, and they're typically cellular, uh, which makes it even more interesting because it it's a fairly high power when you need to connect to the the cellular network yeah. for NB-IoT or even just a regular LTE connection. But then you need to sleep very well in in between. Exactly. That was one of the questions, one of the things that was on my mind as well with those types of applications. Now, if, if we're doing, um, let's say we're doing an application like LoRa um, or, or even Zigbee, typically we can at least have a test environment where we have control of both ends. But when it comes yep. to like narrowband IoT, LTE or even Sigfox, things like that, um, we, we're not in a position where we can control both ends of that application. So what do you, you know, how, how do you uh, then go about sort of um, measuring those systems where you don't really have control of both ends and, and what sort of tricks and tips do you have for developers? Unfortunately, uh, that requires you to measure over longer periods of time. Uh, you, you basically have to average it out, um, not... Not moving the uh, the device around is one way of measuring the the static power consumption and uh, just leaving it. But we have people um, driving around with their uh, their laptop and uh, an OTA Pro and then their device in the in their car, and they they drive one specific um, 
lap around uh, the the city and measure uh, power consumption and performance, uh, which is something that is a lot more difficult with most other measurement equipment. That it's it's simply not portable enough. But it it all comes down to you need to do longer measurements uh, over time than average it because it really doesn't matter what the peak power consumption is and it doesn't really matter what the rock bottom is it's your average power consumption that makes all the difference in the end the total energy spent and it's something that we've uh, we've fixed in the the new software as well that now we actually present power as well not just voltage and current right a lot of the time people are very focused on current and you want low current consumption but you don't yeah. really think about what the voltage is so you need to um you need to think about the total power uh, spent and also the total energy so w- when you perform a measurement uh in the oti software it will tell you uh the total energy in that selection as well yeah along with the average voltage and average current and average power we're running a bit out of time <clears throat> at the minute, so I just wanted to pose one one last question to you um, in this area. So, um, in those situations where I want to do that longer uh, data collection over a longer time period, do I have to do all of that inside the the graphical user interface, or do you have other like some sort of API or something that allows um, maybe some sort of scripts to be written in order for that data to be then? Um, autonomously collected and, and, and saved to a file. Uh, you can um, you can either run it uh, in your graphical user interface, or you can have the user interface running, and then you have a script. For instance, in Python, we support several different uh, other flavors as well. They're they're on uh, GitHub. The the actual uh, APIs, uh, and um, you can run long recordings until you're basically out of. Uh, hard drive space, uh, storage space. And uh, you can, with Oti Ace Pro, you can choose that you might not actually want to record at full 50 kilo sample sample rate. Uh, You can reduce it to a thousand samples a second if you're only interested in, again, the average over a long time. Because that's that's basically our main other difference with Oti Ace Pro that we now go to 50 kilo samples and not just the one and four kilo samples on the arc. Yeah, super. So, but yeah, it's uh, it's definitely possible to do automated testing, um, integration in continuous integration environments. Every time you commit new changes to your firmware, you have an automatic, automatic build and yeah. you have an automatic flash and then measure that the power consumption stays within your envelope, uh, which then you get the warning that it's out of the envelope. Either you fixed something or you broke yeah. something. <laughs> it's well, one or the other. You find out quickly enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Super. Well, thanks ever so much, Werner, for, uh, for that introduction to power profiling. Stay with us and we'll come back to you later at the end of the show yes. and see if we've got uh, some questions from our audience that need answering as well. Super. Perfect. See you shortly. See ya. Okay, then now it's giveaway time. Firstly, I'd like to extend my congratulations to our previous winner, Kapil. Your ESP32 C3 board is on its way. And in this show, I have something new to share. Uh, To extend our thanks to you as loyal Engineering Insights viewers, in this episode, I have a Cytron Cytron Maker Pi RP2040 integrating the new dual core microcontroller from Raspberry Pi. This board is designed for robotics enthusiasts. It includes a dual channel DC motor driver, four servo interfaces and seven Grove IO connectors for sensors and other devices. For your chance to win, simply visit the link below and enter the keyword probing. That's the keyword probing with your entry. And we wish you all the luck with that. Now let's get back to our second guest. Hi, CS. Good to have you into the show. Really appreciate uh, your time. Now, one of the things that's always sort of uh, interested me is that when we buy uh, an oscilloscope, it always comes with that set of standard probes. But um, I've always sort of been a bit uh, questioned, really, what the quality of those are. Um, what, What are the probes that come with an oscilloscope capable of and what are their limits? So 
those as what we usually call them, they are the passive probes. Those are, as its name give away, it's only passive elements in there. So typically they are one of the, uh, I would say as a giveaway, of course, it's one of the lowest costs that we can find to, to build into the, uh, uh, the probe uh, so that it provides a substantial uh, measurement capability. But uh, of course, you wouldn't find that it will be the most accurate measurement result. <clears throat> But as this probe comes uh, readily available, of course, one of the good things is that you can grab it and then just do a simple measurement. So uh, so typically with this kind of passive elements, uh, I would say that you roughly get a pretty good performance all the way until 500 megahertz. And beyond that is usually kind of a stretch to, to go up to around 700 megahertz. Um, there is some industrial push to ask for like, can we go for one gig kind of a passive probe? Uh, unfortunately, we we look into the physical limits, so it's actually impossible to do it on the passive elements. So some of the vendor out there do have like built a one gig uh, passive probe. Actually, they they actually implemented a bit of a smart way to include uh, active elements in there. So it's actually quite a different approach. But anyway. What I want to say is that for this kind of uh, low cost um, giveaway probes, uh, don't expect a very, very tremendous uh, pr performance or accuracy. Now, mm. I was doing some research on, on probes the other day uh, mm -hmm. for, a, for an article I was writing. And, and one of the statements I found uh, was that um, they, they'd said that the, the, the standard passive probes that you get with your oscilloscope, really, you should only consider those for qualitative measurements. So mm -hmm. uh, an approximate feel for frequency, is my signal shape correct? But they're not mm -hmm. really designed for quantitative measurements. Would you say that's the case? Or um, is that a little bit too broad a statement? Well, I'll, I'll say that is, that is quite true to itself. Uh, you have to consider this that <clears throat> as a passive element, so basically what we are looking at is uh, you're, you're looking at the RC filter kind of way, right? And then the question is, when does this RC filter has a flat response and when it starts to curve down to a lower impedance, a lower loading uh, kind of a situation, yeah? So in that sense, uh, as this uh, as an RC behavior, so uh, when you do a high frequency measurement, so I will say that at that point, you will want to think of it more like, a, yeah, whether my signal is there, it's, it's more of a, uh, a <clears throat> qualitative, uh, measurements, but if you really want to go for a precision like within low frequency, I think those are still okay. Uh, so this is something that you have to consider whether you want to look into high frequency part or just a very low frequency static like a DC or so. Or so. Now, um, when we get our probes, there's also lots of different uh, grounding options available. Sometimes, mm. um, or one option at least, is a sort of a crocodile clip on a, on a wire. Sometimes mm. there's a sort of spring that you can attach to the ground ring near to the, the probe connection. Um, mm. And then the other alternative is, of course, is there's just a ground connection on, on the front of the oscilloscope. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to making good measurements, and, and what's, what's the sort of approach to getting the best grounding in order to get the best possible measurement. So usually how I advise uh, the customers when, when working on such, such a setup, uh, usually we want to say that use as short as possible the ground element. Uh, I have a slide here if I can bring up the picture or maybe Stuart can help me to bring up the picture. Ah, hang on a second. Sorry, yeah. we just we just lost you there for a moment, CS. We um, oh, maybe okay. want to start your answer again because we didn't quite hear um, what you were saying. No problem, no problem. So <clears throat> one of the key, I mean, I have a, this slide here pre-prepared just to actually articulate this uh, message more clearly. So basically we want to have um, um, as short ground loop as possible. So whenever you have a, a, a probe connector and if you have a very long ground loop, so if your ground is like a crocodile clip, usually I think it's kind of favorable in that sense because it's easy to, to connect to. But on the other hand, you're creating more like a, very big uh, return path for your signal. So that essentially become more like an antenna where it will pick up a lot of noise uh, from the surrounding circuitry. So no, normally I would say this is a no-no if you, if precision and, and accuracy is what you want to go for. So normally I would advise to go as short as possible. So you can see here in the bottom right, I have like a three probe kind of setup. 
One is with a long ground loop with a with a with a pogo pins that you can connect to it. Uh, uh, and then on the on the first furthest right hand side, you have one that has just a slightly angled up uh, kind of a ground pin connector. And then on the middle, you can see there's one that has a really really uh, close connection. So in terms of the best signal integrity performance, I would always say that the middle one will be the best because it has the lowest ground loop available. So it will pick up as little surrounding emission uh, from the circuitry as possible. So you get a fairly good uh, measurement of this kind of setup. Yeah. Uh, that's great. I, I, I mm. mean, I think uh, most most uh, people will have also noticed that when they're mm. when they're trying to measure signals, that yeah, if you if you try and uh, keep the distance uh, for the ground path as, as short as possible, um, mm -hmm. that the that the sharpness of the image that you're seeing on the screen improves a lot. But um, yes, there's also cases, for example, where um, you want to make a a, sig a measure of signal that's not referenced to ground. Um, mm -hmm. Or you know, there's a, some maybe some differential uh, signaling on on a um, between two devices such as CAN or, or USB are, are good examples. Mm -hmm. Now it is possible to use two sort of passive probes and and then um, enable a, the subtraction capability of the scope in order to to make those measurements. But what what are the challenges with with doing that approach? Uh, and you know what will the quality of the measurement be? So that is one of the smartest, smarter engineer way to, to get around if you don't have a differential probe at hand. So that is one way to get a kind of a differential signaling uh, using the match function of the instruments or the software to help you to, to find out what is the, the subtracted result to, to, to represent the differential waveform. But however, you, we have to also pay attention that uh, not two passive probe are the same. So if, for example, one have a longer ground loop and the other one is shorter, so you, you technically change the behavior of the probe, uh, of the two path. So once these two signal enter into your, your measurement device at the scope, so you will expect there's some, some timing difference between the two, there'll be some amplitude difference. The rising edge may be slightly different on one probe than the other. Yeah. So at the end, you get not a very good result. And we call this the quasi-peak approach, uh, Quasi differential approach for 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 the uh, uh, measurement uh, It's okay. It's doable if you have a slow signal and like, like we mentioned earlier, if you just want to do a qualitative uh, uh, measurement. So I think it's okay. You just yeah, my signal looks like that. It's not too bad. It's it's okay. But if you really want to measure down to whether I meet a certain eye diagram, I need to meet a certain uh, standards requirement. Uh, those will be not the best approach, I would say. So if I know I'm tackling a, a differential mm -hmm. uh, measurement and I was sort of mm -hmm. looking for an alternative way of doing it, if I go onto the um, Roldentrat's website, one of the things that comes mm -hmm. up, of course, is in a, a differential probe. Um, mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit about how differential probes work? So uh, differential probes or works a bit, uh, I mean, just now when we talk about the two uh, passive probe approach, uh, basically, you are taking like a long two leads with a passive probe, with an RC kind of behavior with a long cable down to your scope. Then the scope actually catches this waveform and do the subtraction at on the scope. So for a differential probe is what we also call an active probe. What they offer is that the differentiation is actually done at the probe tip itself. So, so you can imagine that the probe tip is right at where you're sitting on the probe and you will be right on the tip itself. So what is on the tip is actually an active element, uh, like a differential op amp. So it provides this subtraction straight away at the probe tip, so that whatever differences from that um, uh, op amp, uh, differential op amp to the to the probe point will be very short, and that deviation usually is negligible. So that usually provides a very very good uh, uh, differential measurement result. Uh, so, so this is one of the key difference that what uh, uh, this kind of uh, differential probe can offer. Another thing that we can when often that we consider about a differential probe is that we also think about uh, uh, what kind, what we call a common mode rejection. So, imagine if you have two signals who are which are the same on the two differential leads of the probe. So, if you think about a subtraction, basically you get a zero out of it, right? Uh, what happens is that what if uh, you don't get a zero technically because there's no ideal uh, subtraction. So you still get a little bit of residue voltage. So so how good is that probe can suppress that 
uh, common mode signal is what we call a common mode rejection ratio. Yeah. So a differential probe typically is designed to provide a high common mode ratio. Uh, so this is also one thing that usually people will look for when they go for a differential probe. Um, it's very useful if you have a CAN application where you have a noisy environment, uh, you have a model drive that's next to it. So, so those will get emissions that couple into the, the, the wire leads that you try to do the measurement on. So with a differential probe that helps in terms of improving the whole uh, measurement experience and, and accuracy. Now, because we get passive probes with an oscilloscope, I don't think uh, mm -hmm. most people have spent much time understanding how to mm -hmm. maybe select the purchase of a, of a probe. So, mm -hmm. if I'm if I'm I've, I've decided I need a differential probe, what are the sort mm -hmm. of uh, requirements that I should be thinking about when I'm selecting it? Yeah. So first of all, uh, you have to think about uh, the bandwidth, which is related to the rise time of your measurement that you want to do. So there's like a formula, let's say, if you think about it more like a RC behavior, is somewhere around 0 0.35 divided by the uh, rise time, then you get sort of like a like a, like a a uh, bandwidth that you need to do the measurement. So the basic criteria is that uh, the bandwidth should also cover around uh, the third or fifth harmonics of the mesh, the signal they want to do the measurement on. So basically, we are expecting a square pulses, and then we want to see the third and fifth harmonics because those, in terms of frequency, carry the stronger uh, information about the pulse that you try to do the measurement on. So bandwidth is the is the first thing that we need to think about, and the other part is, I mean, as as I mentioned just now, the common mode rejection ratio. So that is also one of the key things that we want to pay attention to. Let's say if you are expecting the signal that your probe has a very strong common mode that is swinging around, then you want to have one that have a higher uh, 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 common mode rejection specific specified so that it gets the job done. Yeah. Uh, of course, there are other parts that sometimes it's not so visible uh, on 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 this probe is that this kind of spec sometimes that changes with frequency. So you will also want to look into the uh, um, we call it the frequency plot of the wave uh, of the response curve, just to give us a, a better understanding. Like every frequency, it will perform the weakest um, um, moment rejection, or it could also have a probe loading at a certain weak point of the frequency that you. Let's say if that's the point they want to do measurement on, then it will be not a, a very unfortunate uh, coincidence. But basically, uh, I think. In, in, in a sense, you look at the bandwidth, look at the, the common rejection ratio, probe loading is also something that's important. And if you want a bit more accuracy, look into the uh, frequency response of those uh, uh, items. Okay. Now, one, one of the other aspects of, of, a, of a, an active probe is, is that that as well also uh, normally comes with some sort of calibration certificate. Um, mm -hmm. that, what sort of, what's, how often do the, the probes themselves need to be calibrated? Typically, we specify it to be a year. So um, so we, we recommend that, let's say, if you want to have a good uh, uh, performance in your result, so definitely uh, every year the probe should be calibrated. So, so we are concerning here is that if you are working in a kind of a lab that you need to have your measurement equipment certified, so a yearly calibration is, is something that is, is a standard requirement. But let's say if you are more of a um, um, hobbyist, uh, just wanted to do some measurements once in a while, so maybe something like a, uh, every two years to do a calibration would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. But let's say if you are really, really on the short end of the, of the budget and you really want to save on it, uh, I would recommend that uh, basically just uh, check the uh, probe performance. So normally on the scope, you have these square pulses that comes up as a, like, a, like a compensation signal. So just check whether the rise time is it still good. Is is there any deviation from DC that you see? If, if from there, you already see that the probe is getting degraded over time, yeah. uh, it's good to send it back for calibration. Yeah. yeah. Now, one of the other aspects, as, as, as you mentioned before, is that the, the passive mm -hmm. probes, they, they have mm -hmm. that RC element in there. And so as a mm -hmm. result of that, the probe has a sort of a capacity of load in this sort of picofarad uh, range. Yep. And mm -hmm. um, some people like myself may have noticed when you when you then use those passive um, probes with very sensitive circuits like crystal oscillators, mm -hmm. you can actually change the, the frequency of operation as a result. Um, mm -hmm. How do active probes uh, solve that problem? Yeah, 
So, so this is actually one of my first few projects when I, when I started off as an engineer and I was given a task to measure this uh, RTC clock that is on a PC motherboard. So uh, I was told to measure this uh, crystal oscillator and I just let my probe and the clock is gone. And I'm like, oh, I, did I, is, is the board spoiled because the, the clock is not there anymore? Then I realized that actually uh, the probe that carries, a uh, passive probe carries around 12 to 15 picofarad. So that ultimately changes the oscillator's uh, behavior. So you lose a clock information easily just by landing there. So when you have a uh, active probe, so so just now when I talk about the differential probe, I talk about a differential op M. So active probe, uh, single ended works in a similar way. So it's, it's the differential part is no longer compared to the negative signal, but to the ground. So imagine if you think about the idea of M, basically the input impedance is technically infinite. So in that sense means that it creates almost zero loading onto the um, crystal circuit. So, so that will not change the behavior. Uh, so this is one of the benefits of using the active probe to do um, uh, uh, this kind of measurement. Another approach that I did in the past is that actually I, I, I use a, uh, I, I got an op app, basically I, I connected it like a unity buffer uh, way just to loop the feedback back into the negative path. So I can still do this kind of uh, measurement uh, using a unity buffer. Uh, but basically the idea is the same. Basically we, we, we use our M to give it a uh, rather high loading, uh, rather high impedance so that it doesn't do so much loading onto the crystal circuits. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, um, are the sort of the, the um, requirements criteria the same uh, when I'm selecting an active probe as, as, the, mm -hmm. as, the, as the process you described for differential probes or are there mm -hmm. some other things I should consider? um yeah i mean depending like like you may you bring on a good point for example like probe loading we, we say it as a term probe loading but it has actually two elements in there one is a resistive loading so it's like um how much your your probe will degrade in terms of the dc there's also a, a capacitive and inductive loading in there as well as you go for higher frequency so those actually we will want to look into the frequency response of the probe loading just to see at which frequency it starts to degrade. So that is something that we want to look into. Unlike the differential probe, so for, for normal single-ended active probe, we are not so concerned about the common mode uh, rejection ratio. But what we will be more paying more attention is basically like the input capacitance of the probe. So usually with an active single-ended probe, we are looking at something below one picofarad. So usually that creates very little uh, loading onto onto like a, a crystal uh, oscillator. On the other hand, we also look into the the input impedance. So we expect it to be very high. So for a good active probe, you can get something at DC. It will be somewhere around one mega ohm, I hope. And then of course, with the increase in terms of frequency, you, it gets lower and lower. But at least at DC, it should be as high as possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we've we've covered two types of uh, probe that you might want mm -hmm. to purchase to sort of extend your capabilities uh, with uh, measurement capabilities. So we've got the differential mm -hmm. probe and and the active probe. What mm -hmm. sort of other measurement situations require a dedicated oscilloscope probe because the the passive probe isn't up to the task? Um, yeah. So so in Rodeo and Shorts, we look into uh, a few scenarios. So actually, we have developed um, a rather special probe for it, which we call the, um, we call it the high precision uh, uh, current measurement probe, but actually it's like a little box where we can fit in, uh, 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 which, which is actually doing a measurement based on a shunt kind of topology. So, so in that scenario, of course, like if you want to measure very precise current at a very, very small uh, level, uh, like what uh, uh, Werner was sharing just now, so that is also a probe that is also available. Uh, another kind of probe that can be very useful is what we call the power rail probe. So let's say if your concern is more on little variation, a little noise onto your uh, DC power, like power ripple noise. Uh, so the power rail probe can also offer something that uh, is very good because it has a very low uh, uh, loading. But on the other hand, what it also provides is what we call a 1x attenuation. So basically when you have a passive probe, they are all uh, about 10x. And on special cases, you want to buy a 1x probe. 
And the reason for that is, that, let's say, if sensitivity is something that you need, then you want to have a one X so that it doesn't get amplified uh, too much by the scope. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, this power rail probe also usually offer something additional, for example, like offset. So let's say if you want to measure a, a battery voltage at 24 volt, uh, unfortunately, with a with a scope input range, normally you can't go to a 24 volt offset at one millivolt per division. Yeah. So in this case, a power rail probe will offer that kind of offset for you so that you can actually move your uh, uh, look into 24 volt range and then try to look at the one volt or even one millivolt per division just to see what is the ripple of that uh, 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 power uh, battery supply. Then that yeah. is something also very uh, interesting to see. Super. Well, mm -hmm. thanks ever so much uh, for those dedicated insights to uh, to mm -hmm. probes and uh, yeah, I think that's, that's fascinating because I think yeah, a lot of people don't get past the the probes that are delivered with the oscilloscope, so it's it's interesting mm -hmm. to find out a little bit more. I'm just going to add Werner back into the the group and uh, have a, a bit of a, a round table discussion and, and pose some some extra questions here. So, um, CS, the first questions for you. Mm. Um, uh, the question is, sometimes it's difficult to tell if my oscilloscope output on the screen matches the real signal, because if I if I move the probe and uh, the signal I see on the screen changes, what mm -hmm. tips do you have for engineers when making oscilloscope measurements to, to, so that they can be sure they're seeing what they're actually measuring? Uh, so normally, okay, so, so this is actually uh, a bit of tricky because the scope will see whatever the probes bring in. So getting a good probe, getting a good setup will determines a lot whether you get a realistic waveform. So in that area, usually I would advise that uh, try to get as little bending as possible and then uh, try to get the probe to be stationary because um, the moment that your probe is somehow moved and your waveform changes, then it means that uh, there is a kind of a noise that is within the circuitry, but either because of a long ground leads, either because the probe point is at an angle that is very close to a emission noise. So that will actually change the behavior uh, quite a lot if you move it around. So in, in that area, uh, I would say that um, uh, usually it's hard to say that we can do a, a quantitative measurement, accurate measurement based on here, but as a, as a, as a qualitative, as just whether the signal is good enough, that would be that would be the case, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even just holding the probe might uh, just couple uh, noise into it as well. So I mean, it's exactly. it's preferable not to even hold it at that point. Yes, <laughs> if possible to stay away and yeah. and have it yeah. somewhere far away. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, getting into the the passive probes with the the mm -hmm. typical input of uh, one mega ohm uh, into the actual scope and then a ten x mm -hmm. passive probe. You're back mm -hmm. at the ten mega ohms of the multimeter which can mm -hmm. significantly load circuits, not just capacitively, but also resistively, yeah. especially mm -hmm. when trying to measure, again, some really high impedance stuff. It, mm -hmm. it really gets you every time when you're not getting the correct measurements that you thought you got. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, how would you actually make your scope or any other measurement uh, device uh, produce trusty results? And basically, you can't mm -hmm. to 100%. <laughs> You're never 100% right. Yeah. No, exactly. Mm -hmm. as, as long as you're closer to 100% than you are to zero, then, then yes. you're okay. You just have just, to realize that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just like to yeah. say a quick hello to Dom, who's watching. Um, he gives us the feedback. It's uh, very helpful information that you're sharing. So thank you, Dom, for tuning in and watching us. Uh, Werner, one of the things I wanted to ask you was um, there's... When, when we look at low power applications, um, having worked at various microcontroller vendors, um, everyone has some sort of low power or ultra low power technology designed into the, the device. But there's often questions around um, when we're building low power microcontroller applications, what should we do with the pins that aren't used? How should we configure them? Should they be inputs or outputs? And if they, you know, if, if they're there, should they be connected to, say, a resistor to the supply voltage or the ground? What what's been your experience as to the the optimal configuration for unused pins? Yeah. Uh, it varies, which is not the re not not the response you want. No. Uh, it's the the thing is, it depends on the uh, the process used to to manufacture the MCU. Um, the the thing with CMOS is what it hates the most is voltages 
right in between low and high. Yeah. Then you consume the most current, and that's basically shoot through straight through the uh, the two MOSFETs. You definitely want to avoid that. And there are several ways to do this, depending on which microcontroller you use. Uh, some can actually disable the input circuitry altogether, basically just taking it out of the equation. Then you then you can leave it completely floating. It doesn't matter. Uh, the easiest way, if the pins are not connected to anything on the board, because you don't need them, you typically just output a zero or a one. You output low or high, it doesn't really matter. Um, at that point, you don't want any pull-ups or pull-downs active. They're typically deactivated as soon as you enable it as an output, not always. So you might actually do the, the wrong thing of pulling it down with an output and then having an internal pull-up just consuming lots of current. Yeah. Uh, so you want one or the other. Uh, from an ESD susceptibility part, you want it to be an output because that's lower impedance. You don't want noise entering your MCU, especially if your next pin is an AD input for an AD converter. Uh, right. Then you definitely don't want that. Same thing with uh, analog inputs that are typically also digital. They need to make sure to disable the digital part of that pin. Otherwise, you're ending up at worst case scenario when you input half input voltage in the analog pin, which is perfectly fine. But if the digital input is still listening there as well and it's connected, you're going to okay. consume a lot of power. Okay, good stuff. That's that's very helpful and provides some sort of good uh, overall background to the to those challenges because uh, that's that's something that's not easy to decipher from from the data sheets of of micro uh, of. Uh, of microcontrollers. Um, yeah. CS, one of the questions I also have here was um, when it comes to sort of electromagnetic compatibility testing, one option is to sort of create um, a probe or just add a bit of wire to the end of, end of a probe and, and hold it near the board. Um, in, what sort of, what sort of, are there probes available to sort of help with sort of a more accurate EMC measurements? Usually, we say that you you want to have uh, I mean, we have a uh, we carry a, a dear field probe, which is more like an antenna, like a loop yeah. antenna where you go, and then it has a proper loop onto it. Uh, if you want to have accurate measurement, try to get those because uh, there is more uniform and 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 it has a fixed width that you can actually determine the bandwidth uh, of the signal that's going through. So it 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 gives a more uniform uh, sniffing. Of the energy that's emitted out from from the from the duty that you want to measure on, uh, some of course let's say if uh, if they have a weakness in terms of like lower frequency that they don't have enough uh, emissions to to pick up, so some actually provide additional amplifier for us to to boost up those particular frequency range just to at least get it to be a normalized kind of field to look into the, the emission. Uh, so those are those are the possible uh, solutions that you can get out there. Using a passive probe with a wire loop is something that I would say that is possible if you just just don't have a, just a sense whether there's some noise coming from there. Uh, but if you want to really measure an accurate one, uh, try to get this kind of uh, near field probes. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is that if if you're picking up mm. noise from a wire mm. connected to a passive probe, you are gonna have a really hard time passing. Um, <laughs> Uh, current EMC um, compliance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It mm. doesn't require much to fail. Um, <laughs> that's that's for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it can. Yeah, it can be very uh, borderline, can't it? At times, trying to <laughs> trying mm -hmm. to keep just under the limits that are allowed. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it depending on time of day and humidity and basically just face of the moon. Yeah, exactly. it's, it's a bit of a voodoo sometimes, <laughs> especially with multiple isolation um, domains. We, yeah. We've been mm. through that. Um, yeah. You get noise everywhere. You yeah. get noise everywhere. Here in, in our lab, typically we pick up the, the GSM noise at around 900 plus megahertz. So, oh. so for us, it's, we don't know if you design something around that range, it's difficult to find out whether it's from the environment or from, from the probe. Yeah. Then it's the question that you have to bring it to a chamber to do some measurement. Yeah. I have a uh, I have two 
blocks mm. of uh, dub plus um, mm. right next to me. Uh, right. mm -hmm. They show up on the spectrum <laughs> as yeah. two distinct rectangles, and you <laughs> yeah. can just forget to measure anything there. Yeah, so yeah. It, it's really difficult when you're when you're not in a shielded environment. Yeah, because right. the signals yeah. are so very low. Mm -hmm. One, one, one of the questions I've got for you, Vern, is is um, bearing in mind you've you've been doing um, as we were chatting earlier the, the working on low power applications for for so many years now. What's what's the most surprising I don't know situation or the most surprising uh, function that you've sort of discovered that uh, has an impact on on low power? Well, there there's uh, the fact that you actually need to to care about low power at all. That's uh, that's one of those uh, realizations that you just have to to get to because when you start out, uh, things like um, the Arduino wiring uh, thing with the the start and then the loop yeah. cares absolutely nothing about really sleeping. Yeah. Uh, so if, if you're if you're starting out with that, and I mean that's the same the same thing when I started out with assembly programming on re very small microcontrollers, you didn't really think about low power because it was really difficult to measure that. So as soon as you actually get the, the measurement equipment to actually make low power, yeah. that, um, that kind of opens your eyes that, oh, there, there are some, some sleep modes that actually work. But yeah. the, the main thing is that you read the data sheet and you see, oh, it can go down to 100 nanoamps. And then you read the fine print and say, the only way to exit this is by a CPU reset. Yes, so it's exactly. basically completely pointless. <laughs> so one one yeah. of those things that you read the data sheet and then, oh, this is going to be great. And then you start designing and then you realize that, oh, this doesn't work. That's, <laughs> that always gets you. And the first time that happens, then it's really annoying. Then you just exactly. know yeah. you, you need to look out for it. I remember um, one of the customers I was working with, they had a, they had a freelancer who was doing some of the code development um, on a DSP. And he'd actually, I don't know how he'd managed it, but uh, this was like 15 years ago. He'd actually uh, measured the current consumption for every in individual instruction in the DSP. And he was writing power optimized code in assembler. So uh, it is possible. <laughs> Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure that's that's the, the preferred way of doing it for everybody. It sounds like quite a lot of effort. I mean, there are there are ways to uh, to theoretically uh, figure out how many of these uh, these flip flops are actually changing state. So and there is some theory behind it, yeah. and it's the same thing with FPGAs, uh, where most people just assume that it will consume the same amount of power no matter what you do and it couldn't be further from the truth yeah. i mean the more clocks you the faster the clocks the the more power consumption you're going to get so there, there is a direct relationship that you need to run as as slow as you can get away with and and so at the lowest voltage and at the lowest voltage uh, most of the the it. smaller uh, the smaller fpgas they they don't really care about um DVFS, no no voltage scaling whatsoever. But um, the bigger ones, they clearly need to. Otherwise, yeah. they get too hot. So we've got another question coming from Annie. I'm going to share this one with you because I'd like to. I'd like your thoughts on this. Annie says, "I love test equipment that also looks good on the bench." Uh, and I think we can all agree that most test equipment is that. I don't know where it came from. That sort of weird grey colour. <laughs> I heard that Disney, okay, the, the, the Disney, um, the people who run the Disney parks, they've got um, a color, a green color, which is sort of like called scene green or something like this. And they paint posts of, of roller coasters in, and doors and things in this green color because, because of the color, people almost don't notice it. And I think it's the same with the, the test and measurement in this industry. We create a, a don't see gray. Um, do you, do you right. think that um, we could do a little bit more effort to make our, our test equipment sexy on the bench? To a degree, I'd say, yeah, but it, um, it's such a large investment. You, you're, not, you're not going to pay for, for the cosmetics per se, but I mean, the, the, the thing with the, um, uh, the, the, the black box... Uh, fa fairly small box. This is engineering 
because the entire box is aluminum and it's heat sink. And then I just uh, find that, yeah, that, that looks fairly good, um, but it's very functional. Yeah. And that's basically the same thing with most test equipment. There's buttons on it because we need the buttons. There's connectors because they need to be there. There is nothing extra, uh, basically nothing extra. <laughs> So, but um, some of the uh, equipment vendors uh, recently changed to a much darker version of gray, black, to yeah. to be more modern. Well, yeah. quite a lot of them. So we're we're getting rid of the beige, I think. So you're, you're getting trendy. I have to admit, though, <laughs> when I first saw the OT Arc, yeah, I was really impressed. The the the, the anodized aluminium casing um, apps looks absolutely fantastic, and and um, it it feels nice in the hand when you pick it up. It feels robust and strong. And, and reliable so there i think there is a quite a lot to to that um cs what what's your opinion on um on test equipment gray and uh, the the um i can't remember the i've forgotten the name of it the the oscilloscope you launched recently that that yeah. uh, definitely has a visual appeal i'd say so that actually also come down to uh the corporate identity what they're what they decided on, like what, what, what color we should use. Yeah. So for most radio and shorts equipment, we, we have a kind of a blue. And now uh, recently we have an update on our corporate identity to, to go to a darker blue, like what they call midnight blue or whatever. But basically that is what determines what we what we put onto the the the, the raisin or the or the casing color. So yeah. so after our artists to the impression if all the engineers agrees that this is the look and feel that we want to go for it you would just go for it i like the I think, blue yeah <laughs> the blue. no I, I think it looks really good it stands out nicely i think it's yeah 99 of the budget went on the technology and one percent went on the design of the case <laughs> so but probably, you, you probably better the right way so. around <laughs> yeah i think the other benefit that you go with a darker gray is that uh it, it, it's hard to go wrong on a gray because then is 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 it doesn't match it like for for us we have problems that sometimes when the material come back the blue is not the blue that we want we right. have to respin yeah. that material oh okay that's a cost though <laughs> yeah exactly also th there is a there is a there's an art to black because mm -hmm. black isn't really black so yeah. black here isn't necessarily black here yeah, yeah um and the fact that it's black is because it's it's a better black body when it comes to getting rid of heat. When we're sinking exactly. current into it, we need to get rid of that heat somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it's actually better to be black than just yeah. the anodized uh, aluminum. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's black is actually, uh, it's not just aesthetics, it's actually functional in this case. <laughs> Well, you'll be pleased to know Dom has also uh, jumped in on the conversation and said that he likes the black box. It's very nice, uh, but he also likes retro equipment and the look at it, uh, look of it. And oh, yeah. I, I, I myself used to spend hours in front of a, um, a Roden Schwartz spectrum analyzer testing um, quartz filters. Um, I think that and that was that was also in the same gray, but it was painted because the equipment was all made out of, uh, of steel panels at that time. This was sort of like oh. the test equipment for the 1960s, I think it was. So, With the proper uh, yeah. really large dials. Big, yeah. big dials. I mean, it took up a lot of space. It was it was big. Yeah. So <laughs> Super, and the, well, the large analog uh, instruments, those yeah. those are yeah. also really nice. nice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, it's been lovely Rachel speaking Steve. to both of you. I've uh, really mm -hmm. enjoyed the conversation and uh, all the information you've been able to share with us. Thanks ever so much uh, for being part of the show. And uh, yeah, we look forward to finding out a bit more in the future. Maybe we can have you back on again and uh, talk a little bit more about uh, measuring very challenging signals. Sounds great. Yep. Super. Thanks very much. Thank you, Stuart. Well, that's about all we have time for in this episode. So what did we learn? Measuring signals in electronic circuits can be very challenging. Am I really measuring the signal that's there or is my method of measurement influencing the results I'm seeing? Battery powered applications have always been challenging to measure due to that high dynamic range of the signal. But without the right tools, how can be sure of the expected battery life, especially under the range of conditions the applications will experience once it's left the lab? Coitex hardware and software not only allow power consumption to be accurately measured, it also allows the impact of a discharging battery on an application to be fully understood. 
Then there are those standard probes that come with your oscilloscope. Yes, they're great for basic measurements, but when things get a little bit more complicated, companies like Rode and Schwarz provide advanced probes that enable accurate measurement with minimal, minimal impact on the signal itself. My thanks today are extended to our experts, Werner Johansson and C.S. Wong. You've delivered us with some outstanding engineering insights. So that wraps it up for today. If you'd like more of the same, we're broadcasting two episodes of Engineering Insights every month in 2023. And to keep you abreast of industry trends this year, take a look at News Bytes, our monthly 15 minute news roundup. Please like, subscribe to Elector TV Industry on YouTube and share our videos on whatever platforms you use. Additionally, you can now drop by the website at electormagazine.com slash EEI to see the topics for future shows and sign up for regular updates and reminders. Finally, if you'd like to join me as a guest, write me an email, drop me a tweet or reach out to me, Stuart Cording on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining, stay in touch and don't forget to keep asking your engineering questions.